Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Tuttle. I'm a portfolio manager here at Krasny Financial. I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, with me today is Eugene Yashin, who many of you know very well. He's uh, going to talk uh, about the U.S. equity markets today. Um, I will uh, get things going with a, with a brief overview of the uh, macro environment and an overview of the U.S. equity markets. And then I'll turn it over to Eugene. He'll comment in a little bit more detail about some of the factors that we're looking at, some of the opportunities that we're seeing uh, in the markets today, uh, particularly growth at a reasonable price stocks and stocks that have exposure to that very important factor. And then we'll cover some of our uh, recent uh, activity in our in our stock models, the uh, uh, what's what's been working, what's been lagging, and then also comment a little bit about some of the changes to our models and, and why we went into those changes. Um, so let's start real quick on an, an, an overview of the U.S. economy. And the, uh, what, what we like to, to do is, is focus on a variety of factors. And I like to think of it as when we make decisions, we weigh the evidence. And so some of the key indicators that we – that we follow on a regular basis, I'm going to highlight here. Uh, so, so volatility in the stock markets is is still fairly low. It's actually extremely low. And February was a very muted month in terms of volatility. We saw volatility indexes basically collapse uh, in February. In terms of Treasury yields, on an absolute basis and relative to history, they're still pretty low. Uh, although there were some sharp moves in the the bond market uh, right after election. So we did see a move from uh, around one and a half percent all the way up. We're pushing up to two and a half percent on the 10 year treasury right now. But historically speaking, that's still a very low level. Uh, yield spread, uh, the difference between uh, higher credit quality and lower credit quality, and also the yield curve, the difference between longer maturity bonds and short or maturity bonds, they're both what I would consider in an uh, in average range. Uh, inflation on an absolute level, still very low relative to history, but that's been creeping upward lately as well. Um, U.S. economy, the data is fairly positive, so I, I would classify our economy in a, in a stable growth phase. All right, so some, some simple takeaways from this, this dashboard is that we believe this environment is supportive of, uh, of stock prices and higher yields. Uh, the economy seems poised for con continued expansion. Uh, earnings, uh, we've just gone through, a, uh, I think, an impressive first quarter where, where the, uh, there was a nice rebound in earnings in the U.S. economy. Um, from a valuation point of view overall, Stocks are getting up there in valuation, so I'd say that, and we have a slide to talk about it, maybe they're not cheap any longer, but we also don't think they're uh, expensive or at bubble levels either. Um, one thing from the risk side is that we have seen quite a rapid move upward in, in stock prices. So this type of pace, basically the stock market, I think since, uh, since the election is up around 11 and 12 percent for the S&P 500. Um, that's only in four or five months' time. So uh, that pace is certainly not sustainable. So we could see some stability or some even some, some minor pullbacks like we may have seen and, and are seeing the last few days. Um, so that's a risk we're watching. But as, we, as I mentioned, we don't expect anything dramatic. Um, this slide is a nice summary of, of what stocks have done and what bond yields have done since the election. And in the red, you can see the S&P 500 has really been strong, has really surged upward uh, since, since November. And on the yield curve, the 10-year, uh, or I'm sorry, in, in terms of the 10-year yield, uh, we see from November to December there was a rapid increase in yields. Since then, we've actually stabilized, and yields have gone up, they've gone down, but overall they haven't moved all that much um, so far this year. One of, the thing, one of the indicators we like to look at is, uh, is the yield curve. And what I'm showing here right now in the, in the yellow is, is 
that yield curve. And, and one of the things we look at is when that yield curve is negative or inverted, that historically has been a sign that the U.S. economy, something's wrong with the U.S. economy and, and recession uh, may be on the way. Um, yield curve right now is far from being inverted. It's, it's positively sloped, which is a good thing and does indicate to us that any talk of recession is probably unfounded if you're, if you're looking at that indicator. On the valuation front, I did mention, uh, you know, stocks are probably in a fair value range. And this is a slide, uh, the data comes from JP Morgan, and you can see that essentially that there's several different value, valuation measures that we look at. And in most cases, uh, the, 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 the slide here or the chart focuses on the PE ratio. You can see uh, current PE of the S&P 500, a little bit above average, historically speaking, but it's certainly well within a normal range and not what I would consider excessive like it was back in uh, 99 and 2000. The uh, interest rates and what the Fed is, is doing and planning to do does get a lot of attention and deservedly so. Um, it certainly seems like the Fed is uh, set to raise rates again this month. Um, after raising them in uh, the fall of, or, or the end of uh, 2016. Um, one thing I'll point out about that is, is why is the Fed raising interest rates? And I think that's an important thing to consider. Um, essentially, the Fed is raising interest rates because the economy is healthier, right? So they, back in 2008, uh, the economy was struggling in order to uh, stimulate the economy, they drove interest rates to absolutely low levels. Um, now that the economy is, is healthy, they're normalizing those rates. And they project slow and gradual rate hike cycle. And if you look at that, historically speaking, stocks have generally behaved okay. They've tolerated those rate hikes in the past. And so the, the, the takeaway to us is that um, the fact that the Fed is raising rates is not necessarily a bad thing. And it's certainly not a reason to abandon stocks, in our opinion. Another dynamic that's been taking place really since uh, the beginning or uh, right, right after Brexit last year, in the, in the middle of the summer, is that active management, which has struggled to keep up with indexes uh, as a style over the last several years, but active management seems to be making a, a comeback. Um, the second half of 2016 and continuing into this year, we see many positive signs for active managers. Correlations between stocks have, this, have uh, declined, and uh, markets seem to be in a position to reward specific, uh, specific factors and should we reward skilled managers. And I, I think that's a, a very good environment for, for our strategy. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Eugene, and he can talk a little bit more specifically on um, our outlook and, and what he sees. Eugene? Uh, thank you, Steve. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, these are our usual slides. So on, on, on this slide, what uh, we would like to point out is that um, as we see, the regimes are constantly changing and evolving. So here we're looking at the uh, value growth um, uh, environment, right? The separation of the markets uh, into a value and growth category. So everything, when you see the the graph line above the red separation line, uh, th that's where value stocks outperform growth stocks, and vice versa. So you can see that lately uh, we have been uh, moving towards value environment where value stocks outperform uh, growth. But as you can see at the very, uh, to the very right, uh, the tipping point kind of reversed. And now we see the, the movement toward the growth stocks. We are not at the pure growth territory. And uh, I will talk more about it. I think we are moving toward the GARP territory. And that means growth at reasonable price. Uh, in terms of the size preference, uh, we've seen over the last uh, year and a half uh, real 
strong movement towards, you know, small caps. Small caps outperformed last year. Uh, but recently they kind of subsided a little bit, but uh, that could be a short kind of anticipation of the Federal Reserve move uh, phenomena. Uh, we still believe the small caps look uh, a little more uh, favorably uh, versus the uh, large caps. <clears throat> Uh, following our proprietary multi-factor uh, macro model, uh, we still uh, prefer industrials, materials, technology, energy, and telecom. And most of these are of a cyclical nature. And uh, that uh, kind of um, bodes well for, you know, the assessment of the overall economy and the health of the overall economy. Uh, we'll look at the uh, plethora of macro indicators, uh, bond market and stock market indicators. Um, so uh, that's pretty good. Um, and you can see the on, on, on this slide the evolving nature in, of the forecast. So uh, you see pretty much um, every against every month uh, the forecast uh, for the next 12 months for a specific economic sector. So you can see that, for example, consumer discretionary from being uh, uh, one of the favorite sectors uh, became uh, less appealing. And uh, financials uh, kind of starting to lose their appeal. Uh, industrials, on the other hand, are still looking very strong and so do, uh, so do materials and uh, uh, technology is actually getting some uh, steam as well. So that brings us to pretty much, you know, like major themes we see in the marketplace. So as I said before, we're shifting away probably from pure value environment to more of a GARP environment. So that means growth at reasonable price. So we're looking at businesses and companies with real good growth projections, but also uh, price reasonably or or uh, with less, uh, you know, premium versus the peers. Margin and globalization, again, the profits of U.S. corporations, uh, we saw at very healthy levels after the fourth quarter of 2016, and uh, uh, most of the companies are done reporting. Uh, but, as a, again, the globalization, there is a threat of trade wars still in the air, and... Uh, uh, you know, smaller companies would, for example, benefit if uh, something like that, uh, uh, you know, started. But we just don't see that happening yet, and we hope it's not going to uh, come to fruition. Um, on the, this slide, we're looking at factors and which factors work and which don't. Um, in the, you know, we, we color-coded the columns, so you see the green columns are your, you know, usual value factors, price to earnings, price to book, price to uh, sales. Then we have a couple growth factors, earnings growth and sales growth. Then we have a uh, few quality factors, operational profit margin, return on equity, uh, return on assets. And then we also have a couple of safety factors in yellow. So what you see here is the by quarter progression of how factors work. So we take companies which are really good, which have real good um, related factors, and then the average, and when we compare the performance of those, right? So, and then we we can understand whether current PE is meaningful and working versus, you know, growth as, uh, of earnings or sales. So lately, you can see at the very bottom for you know, the last couple quarters of 2016 and the beginning of 2017, you can see that value factor is becoming more green. So value has been working for a uh, few quarters now. And uh, growth factors in orange, they're still kind of reddish, so they're not kicking in. And quality factors are in line with growth factors and safety factors are turned off. Usually that pattern, if you look at 2011, it kind of evolves, right? First you start with value, then growth becomes green, then quality.
quality becomes green, then safety. So we see those patterns all the time, and we monitor them, and we adjust portfolios accordingly. <coughs> so now I'm going to uh, talk about what worked and what not in our portfolios. Uh, we've taken positions ahead of time, and obviously um, uh, financial, IT, and consumer discretionary worked in our favor. Uh, financials uh, reacted to potential uh, um, uh, loosening of regulations. Uh, IT uh, marching with the phenomenal profit margin, and uh, you know we just capitalized on that. And consumer discretionary, uh, you know, sector benefited from the stock selection selection we had in the sector and the fact that. Uh, you know, people, the job market is pretty tight, so people have more money to spend on discretionary items. Um, energy and consumer staples didn't work out so well. Energy has been pretty volatile, and consumer staples, um, uh, in our opinion, are overpriced. So we just didn't want to participate in what we call safety bubble, which we believe is still kind of present with utilities, consumer staples, and telecom having pretty hefty, uh, um, you know, valuation. So, from what I've kind of described, what uh, it took us to the, you know, to the our regular quarterly rebalancing of the portfolios, which uh, uh, some of you saw as being pretty light. Uh, we moved, um, we kept moving towards mid and small caps. Uh, we uh, started shifting slowly to GARP, to growth at reasonable price, but we've been already positioned towards that phenomenon. So it really didn't take much for us to uh, keep the portfolio optimally uh, balanced. And from a sector standpoint, we still overweight industrials, financials, and materials. So essentially, we just swapped and uh, NASDAQ for SSMC, and we beefed up uh, Chicago Bridge just a little bit. So this is the composition of our uh, strategic equity portfolio. Uh, as you can see, we still like information technology. Uh, uh, we are uh, overweight in financial. We're in line with healthcare, uh, slightly uh, light on consumer discretionary, overweight industrials and materials. So overall, by the overall, you can see that the portfolio is pretty well balanced. Um, our strategic dividend equity portfolio has a slightly different mandate from our strategic equity portfolio. From, uh, you know, uh, this portfolio is designed to uh, provide the exposure to more of like a blue chips of, of the market. You know, so we obviously prefer large caps uh, in this posturing. Um, from a style standpoint, uh, obviously the companies which pay hefty dividends uh, are for the most part value companies. So uh, the value uh, tilt is kind of inherited uh, in, in the portfolio. And from a sector standpoint, we still like the overweight industrial um, energy and materials to keep us, you know, with a high dividend yield. Uh, and as you can see uh, from the table below, uh, again, very light rebalancing. We uh, sold a couple positions, uh, uh, Raymond and uh, Digital Realty uh, Fund, uh, uh, REIT, and we bought uh, SEC and International Paper. Uh, kind of shifting a little bit towards industrials and materials. But as you can see, uh, our dividend was uh, uh, pretty much unchanged. And from the uh, composition, you see that it's a very well uh, balanced portfolio. Financial, you know, going to have a heavy presence here because of the dividend. And industrials, information technology, energy, and healthcare have a really good presence here as well with utilities and consumer discretionary and materials. So it's kind of a very, um, um, you know, evenly spread portfolio with a pretty, pretty uh, uh,
reach dividend yield. I'm good. All right, Eugene, thank you very much. Um, if anyone does have any questions that they want to follow up with, either Eugene or myself, uh, please contact our office. We're always available to speak. Uh, there was one question that came in, Eugene, um, um, just a general question about how, how long is, is the boom in the stock market expected to continue? I, that's a question that I do, I do hear coming up from time to time. People are getting a little nervous that we're near highs and bull market's been lasting for a long time. Is there any concern about that? Right. Um, we, and, and that's a very valid, you know, question, and people do have concern about the, uh, you know, the market and the economy, especially with the economy going on the eighth year of expansion. I do want to point out that, historically speaking, economies uh, grew um, on average, um, four to five years lately, those cycles became longer. So it's not uncharacteristic to see economy growing for seven years. And we actually had a period of economy uh, where economy grew for 10 years. So um, with the pace of the growth we've experienced in this expansion, uh, you know, we have room to grow economically because the expansion has been so slow in in com comparing uh, to historic <laughs> recovery so uh, we see that there is still uh, for, uh, room for the economy to grow and also we did have a recession in earnings mostly driven in corporate world by energy and partially affected industrial uh, sectors but what we see now is energy stabilizing, earnings are very healthy, and the projections are very healthy. We see the uh, managers of companies are very uh, enthusiastic uh, for the most part, and, and what we haven't seen yet is actually businesses starting heavily investing in, in, in uh, you know, production capacity and so on and so forth. So, we see there is uh, definitely room for growth, and if current administration, you know, uh, keeps being uh, business friendly, we will see, uh, uh, I think, very good things for corporate America in the future. Great. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you all for joining us today, and uh, hopefully we will speak to you all soon. Have a great night. Thank you. Have a good night.